if you look about the living world, probably the most salient fact of it is that there is this amazing diversity of organisms within it. And among those organisms, there's a similarly astonishing uh, diversity of various traits that fit the organisms to be environments in which they live. And it's interesting to consider that at some point, each of those adaptive traits is fundamentally linked to evolution. And this goes into the question of evolutionary novelties. At some point, every trait was a novelty. But what are novelties? In general, they are specifically regarded as qualitatively new structures, functions, or other traits that allow organisms to access new ecological opportunities. So uh, we regard as novelties new traits of long-term consequence. And these would include, among other examples, photosynthesis, aerobic metabolism, vision, life. They've been extremely uh, important in the history of life because they are tied to diversification, speciation, and also increased ecological complexity. And all of this comes from the fact that they can fundamentally set evolution onto new paths and open new possibilities. So the origin of evolutionary novelties has been a central question in evolutionary biology going all the way back to Darwin. As all of you likely know, on November the 24th, 1859, the first edition of On the Origin of Species was published. And this, of course, was the seminal event in modern biology. The origin has become the foundational text for much of uh, subsequent biology. But contrary to common belief, what Darwin did in the origin was not originate the idea of evolution. It's actually very old, going back to the pre-Socratic philosophers and then popped up time and time again throughout the history of um, Western thought. Uh, we've seen in the writings of uh, Roman naturalistic philosophers and poets like Lucretius, again in uh, the Middle Ages with St. Augustine and St. Thomas, as well as in the scholars of the Islamic Golden Age. And then uh, it found new life in the 18th and 19th centuries during the scientific revolution. Comte de Buffon uh, wrote about it as did Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus, who actually propounded an idea of evolution in a, a I kid you not, long narrative poem about the sex lives of plants. Uh, and uh, then, of course, in Jean Petit's remarks uh, writings. But what Darwin did do was twofold. First, he presented what he called one long argument that brought together many diverse lines of evidence and showed how they suggest that life evolved. And it was a very strong argument. Darwin had spent more than 20 years amassing this huge wealth of um, evidence and putting it together into an argument. And it was so persuasive an argument that evolution became the central organizing concept in biology by the 1870s. The other thing he did was, of course, he articulated the first workable and naturalistic mechanism of not only evolutionary change, but also adaptation, the fitting organisms to their way of life. This, of course, is the concept of evolution by natural selection. Just very simple. Uh, Dr. Kennedy just went over it. Uh, but to quickly review and to uh, set up what I'm going to go into, populations are made up of individuals that vary in their heritable traits. And then there's competition for resources in the environment in which the population resides that exerts a selective force on the population. That any heritable trait that improves the ability to compete for these resources in a given environment, they allow the individuals possessing that adaptive trait to have more offspring on average. And so over time, the adaptive trait becomes more frequent in the population, and the population, not individuals, but the population evolves with the average individual within the population becoming more fit to its place in nature. And then this process repeats over and over and over again with beneficial traits accumulating over time. And so natural selection effectively adapts and builds by taking advantage of random variation arising from heritable changes based entirely upon their effect on reproduction. This is undirected, opportunistic, powerful, and never ending. As Darwin put it himself, natural selection is daily and hourly scrutinizing throughout the world the slightest variations, rejecting those that are bad, preserving and adding up all that are good. 
Now, something that can be noted in this is a bit of a problem. That is that of evolutionary novelty. So it's easy to see how natural selection can refine a tree over time. After all, if larger ears or a large nose or a larger neck improves the ability to compete for resources, then natural selection, of course, will drive these organs to get larger over time. But how can evolution by natural selection innovate? How can it create new traits? Well, this, of course, is an issue that was seized upon very rapidly by Darwin's critics. And one of the most significant was uh, this man here, St. George Jackson Navart. And uh, lest anyone get confused, St. George was, in fact, his first given name. His parents were kind of odd. Uh, and uh, he was a one-time protege and very close friend of T.H. Huxley. He originally very strongly supported Darwin, but he then became highly critical of Darwin's ideas, and his criticisms focused on this issue of how new traits can evolve. And before I go on, I'll just have a quick tangent on him, because he's actually someone who really needs to be the subject of a great novel, because he's a horribly tragic figure. Um, he turned on Darwinism in part because he converted to Catholicism, and in his convert zeal, he became worried that Darwinism violated his faith. And also, he was really put off by Huxley's, well, frankly, Huxley was a bigot toward Catholicism, and that, you know, hurt Mithard's feelings, and he sent him off on another direction. Now, this resulted in him being ejected from Darwin's circles and being ostracized by biology in general. But he then later went on to try to harmonize science and Catholicism as a result that he irritated the church. And he actually died under interdict due to these ideas. That's the step right before its communication. And so he couldn't be buried um, in consecrated ground until his family was able to uh, petition the Vatican for dispensation four years after the fact. And in fact, his writings, unlike Darwin's, were put on the Vatican's index of banned books until the index was banned. Uh, was abolished in 1966. So in 1871, actually before his big break with Darwin, Liver published on the genesis of species. And for some reason, he didn't understand why this was a poke in the eye, this very name. And in chapter two, which was entitled The Incompetency of Natural Selection to Account for the Incipient States of Useful Structures, Navarre wrote, natural selection simply and by itself is potent to explain the maintenance or the further extension and development of favorable variations, which are at once sufficiently considerable to be useful um, from the first to the individual possessing. But natural selection utterly fails to account for the conservation and development of minute and rudimentary beginnings, the slight and infinitesimal commensal of structures, however useful those structures may afterwards become. He, in fact, is the originator of the what use is 5% of the wing argument that we still hear from creationists today. Darwin took these criticisms very much to heart. He considered them to be very serious, and he addressed them. And that's most obvious here in this, which is a panel from a really great animation put together in 2009 by Ben Fry called The Preservation of Favored Traces. So this is a depiction of the text of the origin of species as it evolved through multiple um, editions as Darwin rethought ideas and responded to critics. And the red in there is actually what was in the final sixth edition of the origin. You'll notice the huge red block. That is an entire chapter that Darwin added called Miscellaneous Objections to the Theory of Natural Selection. And it was really a point-by-point -point refutation of what Maillard argued in his book. So Darwin took this very seriously. And that criticism forced Darwin in that chapter to elaborate on an idea that he'd actually uh, discussed a little bit in the first edition, which he wrote, any change in function which can be affected by insensibly small steps is within the power of natural selection so that an organ rendered during changed habits of life, useless or injurious for one purpose, might easily be modified and used for another purpose. So current function does not necessarily suggest past function. 
and a highly specialized structure that performs a novel function that easily evolved from a prior structure or function that did something entirely different. So the problem of incipient form of a structure or a trait is not an issue if it's in incipient form with something else entirely. So Darwin argued that old structures could give rise to new functions in two distinct ways. The first was through redundancy. So there are organs or structures that have multiple functions. Typically there's one major one and then uh, a number of incidental functions as well. And often you have multiple copies of a structure or an organ that perform these same functions. And that means that there's an opportunity for specialization in the subset. Selection can act on one or more of the redundant copies to refine one of those incidental functions and in so doing cause them to develop a new major function while minimizing the original one. And then the original major function is maintained by the unmodified copies. So you don't lose anything by this modification. So Darwin's example, which has been borne out by modern work, is with mammary glands, which he argued evolved from a subset of sweat glands, which we now know to be true. The second way uh, was the loss of need for an original major function. So if there's a shift in the habitat of the organism or its lifestyle, and in so doing, an organ or structure is no longer needed for its original function, selection is free to uh, select for a new function. So Darwin's example was the evolution of swim bladders uh, into lungs during transition to land. Now Darwin, as it turns out, we now know is completely backward in this because swim bladders actually derive from lungs, but the principle is fundamentally the same. So another example, probably the most famous one, is with feathers. So feathers evolved in dinosaurs long before flight did, and was likely involved uh, first in thermal regulation. Then later they were modified for use in display, and still later for use in flight. But those original major functions were still maintained Feathers are still used for thermal regulation and display, and in fact, if you look at the kiwi, feathers really only function for thermal regulation. In fact, kiwis, if you look closely at them, their feathers really are like fine hairs, and they're often referred to as honorary mammals as a consequence. Cute ones, too. <laughs> so Darwin called this the principle of functional shift. And in modern evolutionary biology, we call it co-option or acceptation after Stephen J. Gould's uh, suggestions. But regardless of the name, the principle is the same. Evolution tinkers, and it makes the new by modifying the old. But this also goes on in the genetic level. The genes can be shuffled around in the genome, put under different regulation, or linked together into new regulatory networks producing new traits. This has underlied a lot of uh, the developmental changes that have been involved in the evolution of multicellular organisms like humans. Also, there's something called domain shuffling, where pieces of old genes can be stitched together by mutations that recombine pieces of the genome, resulting in new genes with fundamentally new functions. As uh, the Nobel Prize winner Francois Jacob put it, evolutionary novelties come from previously unseen association of old material. To create is to recombine. So even at the most basic level, evolution jury rigs to meet challenges and exploit opportunities. So if evolution had a patron saint, it must certainly be MacGyver. <laughs> I'm glad all of you got that. I talked about this in, in high school. So no one anymore. It's very sad. <laughs> so we're now in the genomic age, and a number of evolutionary innovations resulting from such genetic tinkering have been inferred in the massive data that we've collected. But usually these are very old, and the details are hard to work out. Now fortunately, we can study evolutionary innovations in fine detail as they arise during the course of evolution experiments. Now evolutionary, um, experimental evolution is actually an old Technique. It originated with William Henry Dallinger, who was a correspondent of Darwin's, who was an English Methodist minister as well as being a biologist and uh, microscopist. And he read The Origin and was just enthralled by it. And he decided to undertake an experiment, and he actually wrote Darwin about this 
And um, uh, Dowager wrote, he wanted to undertake an experiment made with a view to discovering whether it was possible by changing the environment in minute life forms whose life cycle was relatively soon completed to superinduce changes of an adaptive character. The observations are extended over a sufficiently long period of time. So Dallinger's experiment actually lasted seven years, from 1880 to 1886. And unfortunately, Darwin didn't get to see the, uh, the end of it, because he died in 1882. And in this experiment, Dallinger cultivated three microbes in a special incubator that he designed and built himself. And he started the cultures growing at 60 degrees Fahrenheit, and slowly over the years, gradually increased the temperature until, by the end, shortly before the apparatus terminated the experiment early by burning, uh, he had the cultures growing at 158 degrees Fahrenheit. And interestingly enough, the ones at the end, he put them back at 60 degrees, they died. So they became highly specialized to those later ones. So this was a technique there very early on, but it was largely forgotten for a while before being reborn in the 1980s. And it's now a major approach to uh, uh, examining evolution today. That brings me to the lab in which I work, which, uh, as we mentioned, is in that of uh, Richard Dunsky. And uh, yes, it is true, he is a great genius. Uh, and we specialize in using evolution experiments using bacteria to address very basic questions. Now, why would we use bacteria? Well, they reproduce very quickly. They can attain very large population sizes in small containers, and that provides a lot of risk for natural selection and work. They're very easy to work with, and we have many tools available for studying them at the genetic and molecular level to try to figure out how evolution is working. And of course, unlike zebras, they can be frozen and revived without any loss of viability. We're humans. Uh, so the centerpiece of the lab's work is the E. coli long-term evolution experiment, or LTEE, which was begun in 1988 when Rich found in 12 populations from a single clone of E. coli B strain REL606. And these have since been evolved under a daily serial transfer regime in a minimal glucose medium called DM25. Now, under the conditions of the experiment, each population experiences about 6.67 generations per day. And at that pace, over the 26 years so far of the experiment, we've been able to observe over 61,500 generations of evolution in each of the 12 populations. And because we freeze samples every 500 generations, and those remain viable, we have a complete viable frozen fossil record of the evolution of all 12 going back to the very beginning, providing us with a rich resource from which we can draw at any time to study a variety of evolutionary questions as they occur to us or as new technologies arise. Now, it's important to recognize when it comes to the evolution that takes place in this experiment that we don't sort the cells during transfer. I'm not sure how we would do that. We don't pick through them. That would be really tedious if it were possible, but we don't. We just provide the environment. The environment is what does the selecting, so that any trait that improves fitness under the conditions is what's selected for. It's entirely unconscious, and this is entirely a natural selection experiment. It's not artificial selection. What's more, it's a very simplified system. There's no sex that takes place, at least not that we know of. It's possible we could evolve it, and we haven't seen evidence of it yet. There's no invasion or migration. Each population is effectively on its own planet and its own galaxy. Nothing goes in, nothing goes out, except for you know, the cells and the cells as they transfer. And we keep the environment safe. So there's no environmental change. There are no asteroids, there's no climate shift or anything. So the experiment involves only the very core processes of evolution, mutation, genetic drift, and natural selection. This makes it easier, though by no means easy, to figure out how evolution is working. And because, as Jacques Renaud observed, anything found to be true of E. coli must also be true of elephants. And because evolution is what all life has in common, what we learn in this experiment tells us a good bit about all life, not only here on Earth, but wherever it might be in the universe. So the experiment started with a certain set of original aims and goals that are still being pursued. But because of its long-term nature, unforeseen things happen. 
Evolution sometimes throws curveballs that are very interesting. Plus, new questions arise, new technologies arise that give us new avenues of research, and these then provide opportunities to pursue fortuitous aims. So looking at the original goals, one of the major ones was to examine the dynamics of evolution. So how quickly do the populations evolve? And does the rate change over time? Does it ever stop? Well, as it happens, fitness improved rapidly at first, but then it slowed down, and it's never stopped. And in fact, a paper that just came out last year by my colleague um, Mike Weiser showed that, in fact, from the data we have so far, the populations will still be getting more fit 100,000 years from now, and in fact, 100 million years from now. It, there's such a large supply of available possible beneficial mutations that natural selection just doesn't stop. Another major goal was to examine the repeatability of evolution. Now keep in mind, all the populations started out genetically identical. They came from a single cell originally, and they've evolved under identical conditions. So this has been very much like running the exact same experiment 12 times simultaneously. And so we can ask the question, do they evolve in the same way, or do they get rid wildly? We've seen a bit of both. There's a lot of parallelism. All the populations have gotten much better growing under the conditions provided. All of them grow much, much faster than their ancestor under the conditions. All of them have evolved larger and rounder cells. And all have accumulated mutations in several of the same genes. So they found some of the same adaptations across all 12. But there have also been differences. So each has accumulated a unique set of mutations. At least three of the evolved complex ecologies would increase diversity, <coughs> which means there's coexistence of multiple different types of E. coli within them, indicating possible speciations taking place. About half of them have evolved defects in their DNA repair that cause them to have much higher mutation rates than their ancestor. And then finally, one population did something really, really nifty. And to understand what this is, I have to note that throughout the duration of the experiment, there has existed an open ecological opportunity that arises from the fact that the DM25 block in which we maintain the bacteria contains not only 139 micromolar glucose as their primary food source, but also 1,700 micromolar citrate, which we include to help the bacteria take up iron from the medium, which constitutes a potential second food source. I stress the word potential, because while most E. coli can ferment citrate anaerobically, the inability to grow in citrate under aerobic conditions, this is to say a Cetimidus phenotype, is a key and defining characteristic of E. coli as a species. It's very important in the medical setting to help E. coli be differentiated from salmonella. See, to them, when oxygen is present, citrate just isn't food. Moreover, the Cetimidus phenotype is a very stable trait. Only one spontaneous aerobic citrate using or sit plus movement E. coli is reported the entire 20th century. So it ain't easy to do. But in early 2003, almost 15 years in the course of the experiment, and just after the freezing at generation 33,000, one population, which we call Aerobites 3, suddenly expanded almost tenfold. That caused it to get much cloudier, as you can see in the pictures here. This expansion was ultimately found to be due to sit plus variants that had originally evolved in the population around 31,000 uh, generations, were initially extremely poor at using citrate under the conditions of the experiment. But natural selection then refined the trait over the ensuing 2,000 generations or so, until those later stronger variants that resulted were able to rise to dominance in the population and cause the expansion of food us into their existence. Now, it's important to note that the SIP plus did not sweep the population. After they became dominant, a subpopulation of SIP minus clones persisted. So this showed that there was an increase in diversity that might in fact uh, indicate speciation. And I'll speak a little more uh, about this in the end. So SIP plus gives us many opportunities, and one of which is to study the evolution of a new trait. So we can ask the question, what's the origin of sip plus? For all, any evolutionary change ultimately has to come down to mutation. So we can ask, what's the genetic change that produced the new sip plus phenotype? Now to get to that, it's best to think uh, along the lines of a different question. And this is, what's the basis of the sip minus phenotype? 
it seems a little strange that they would be zip minus because E. coli has the machinery to metabolize sensory, and it does so during uh, aerobic growth of other substrates. There all, it does have a complete TCA cycle, which I got to admit, I always have to look this up. I was, I was made to memorize it many times, as I'm sure many of you make your students do all the time. I still don't remember it. Uh, Y'all are probably sick of it by now, though. Uh, so when you get down to it, the problem is this. E. coli does not make a citrate transporter when oxygen is present. So it has no way to get citrate into the cell. It effectively has no mouth for citrate. But given that most E. coli can run citrate when oxygen is present, it clearly has a citrate transporter, which we know of and we call it CIT-T. And it's, but it's only turned on when there's an oxygen there. So it would make sense in trying to figure out what causes CIT plus to look for genetic changes in CIT plus clones related to the CIT gene. So this being the genomic age, we went about this by sequencing the genomes of dozens of clones that we had isolated from different time points in the population's fossil record. And this generated a lot of data, a ton of data. Well, actually more than a ton. Uh, the associated data files totaled more than five terabytes. To give you some idea of how much this is, if it were printed out, it would require 2.3 billion pages of paper. And uh, to give you some idea of how much this is, it would weigh about as much as a Ticonderoga class highly <laughs> missile cruiser, which clocks in at about 10,000 tons fully loaded. So a lot of data. Thankfully, I had the help of a postdoc in the lab at the time named Jeff Garrett, who's actually now a professor at UT Austin, who was able to develop a data pipeline that processed this huge mass of ones and zeros into something that a computer dummy like myself can make sense of. And one of the things that we did with this process data was reconstruct the population's phylogenetic tree. And uh, we then wanted to look for mutations involving the CIT gene in the CIT plus clones, but not in CIT minus. And you'll notice all of the CIT plus clones uh, map to this one clade within the population, with all of the others being CIT minus. So the real question is, what happened right there? Well, as it happens, looking in at the CIT T region of the ancestral genome, we see this. But in CIT plus genomes, this segment was duplicated. So in the CIT plus clones, this region looks like this. The copy segment is there in a canon head and tail orientation that suggests a hypothesis of what causes the CIT plus trait. Now to understand this, I have to remind you that all genes have associated regulatory elements called promoters that tell the cells when to turn the gene on and off. In the CIT minus ancestor, the um, uh, promoters look like this, and in fact, the CIT-T gene is part of this operon controlled by a promoter that normally keeps everything tightened off when oxygen is present. But you'll notice, downstream of, of uh, CIT-T, there is a promoter for the gene RNK, and it turns RNK on when oxygen is present. And this is interesting because if we look again at uh, what this region is in CIT+, plus, we see that RNK promoter is now upstream of CIT-T, and it's turned on when oxygen is present. So the hypothesis is that the duplication created a novel RNK CIT-T module in which CIT-T is under the control of um, the RNK promoter, which results in expression of the CIT-T transport when oxygen is present, and thereby provides access to citrate. So I tested this hypothesis by using a genetic engineering technique called gene forging to move uh, that little segment containing the RNK promoter and put it into CIT G and CIT minus. So this was a matter of reconstructing the RNK CIT T module. And the only difference between this construct and its CIT minus parent is that one little bit that we inserted. As it happened, the engineered clone was in fact CIT plus and could grow on CIT rate. Uh, so this uh, uh, supported very much the hypothesis that duplication is the basis of CIT plus. And in fact, this conferred an extremely weak uh, CIT plus phenotype, which was very much in line with what we saw in those early CIT plus clones that could barely be situated at all. 
natural selection had to accumulate mutations that refine growth after C plus initially evolved. So, what we see here is that C plus really arose from a recombination of pre existing elements. So, it's a clear example of that uh, evolution by molecular tinkering that I talked about earlier. Shifting gears, there's another big question. Why the heck did C plus take so long to evolve? There's that huge amount of potential food there, but it took almost 15 years and it only happened once among 12. So, what gives? Well, to get to this, we have to discuss something called historical contingency. And this is a property of complex causal systems in which history matters in determining what outcome occurs such that changes in that history can change the outcome. So this is the basis of these perennial what-if scenarios that we like to entertain slash torment ourselves with. So what if the South had won the Civil War? What if Hitler had died in World War I? What if Steve Jobs had not gone back to action? <laughs> what if Darwin had not ended up on the Beagle or had fallen overboard during one of his many bouts of seasickness? Um, or, you know, we do this all the time in our lives. Uh, what if we had turned right and started left? Would we have gotten that accident? What if we had gone to the coffee shop on this day instead of that? Would we not have better submit than another? Yes. All sorts of things. So Stephen J. Gould, the great paleontologist, noted that evolution itself is an inherently historical phenomenon with the possibilities for the future depending on what's happened in the past. And there is a lot of past evolution. All living organisms have an unbroken chain of ancestors stretching back 4 billion years to the last common ancestor that approached them before. I can guarantee this of every one of you in here without knowing anything about you aside from this, which is none of you had ancestors that died before having children. All of you have linkage going all the way back. That's a lot of history. And what Gould argued is that if one were to replay the table of life as a consequence of this history and sensitivity of outcomes to history, one would, each time one replay the table of life, see a completely different living world evolve. So taking off on this, I pose the hypothesis that I call the historical contingency hypothesis, which was that the evolution of C plus required multiple mutations. So let's say it required four in order to become C plus. You only had A, you were still C minus. A and B, no luck. A, B, and C, no. Only if you get all four, you get to be C plus. So cumulative selection in a case like this cannot facilitate the accumulation of these mutations because it's not forward looking. It doesn't know the future. So the accumulation of those necessary mutations had to be an incidental and chance byproduct of history. And C plus evolved in error minus three because it happened to accumulate one or more of the needed mutations over the course of its history. And these uh, potentiated the evolution of C plus because after all, once you have A, B, and C, you just need D, which is a super far smaller hurdle. And thankfully, in the lab, we can do this. And I was able to test um, the hypothesis by replaying the tape of C plus evolution from different points in the history of this population. So I was able to go into the freezer in the fossil record of error minus 3 and refound the population from cells isolated at different points and then look at the pattern of C plus evolution. So if the historical contingency hypothesis is correct, it should be easier to re-evolve C plus after it became potentiated, after the necessary mutations, uh, those necessary predetermining mutations took place, and then I should see more re-evolution of those at later time points. Because after all, if an outcome is uh, crucially dependent upon a given event, it becomes more possible after that event takes place. Another way of thinking about this is, say the experimental history department at MSU, which does not exist, unfortunately, we're to hypothesize that the Allied victory in World War II was potentiated by the success of the Allies at uh, the DNA invasion. So they hop in their TARDISes, they replay World War II from various time points and know how often the Allies win. So if D-Day really was the crucial point, then they would expect to see a much, much higher rate of Allied success after that time period. So the exact same thing, only, you know, realistic. Uh, so one way I did this, the elegant way, was to rebound the population 72 times through 12 different time points. And then I evolved these for about two years 
or 3,700 generations were the same conditions as the main long-term experiment. What I observed were four instances of SIP plus re-evolution, and all of them in replays that were begun from later generations. So this strongly supported the contingency hypothesis. But that was two years, which is a long time to wait, and I get bored easily. So I decided to try it another way as well, the brute force way, in which I isolated 271 clones from 14 different time points in the fossil record and grew up huge populations, huge cultures of each end replicate, and then spread all of the cells on petri dishes in which the medium contained only citrate and grow on. So only the rare set plus mutant cells can grow and form colonies. So this way it'd be easy to catch re-evolution events. So I tested a lot of cells. In fact, 40.4 trillion, which is 404 with a lot of zeros after it. <laughs> and I observed set plus to re-evolve 13 different times. All of these occurred in replays that began, um, that were begun from clones I said for generations 20,000 or later, strongly again supporting the historical contingency hypothesis and arguing that some mutation and mutations, and right now we think that there were at least two, that occurred prior to generation 20,000, and these made evolving surplus much more likely. So what are the implications of this? What does it mean? Well, Natural selection can only select from the variation that actually arises. And prior evolution determines what variation can arise because it sets the variation on what side of the equation. So this means that past evolution can, in fact, strongly impact future evolution. It doesn't always, but it can. This is going to be particularly true of evolutionary innovations because selection, as I talked about earlier, cannot directly facilitate the discovery of new functions because they don't exist yet. Now, uh, natural selection is blind to what can be and only sees what is. History then will determine whether or not the variation that arises does in fact include the innovation that can be selected for. So here we come upon another big question. This is that of whether or not SIP plus might in fact be an incipient species. After all, it does something that E. coli isn't supposed to be able to do. And in fact, I was at an ASM conference one year, and a medical microbiologist came up and looked at my poster and said, this is really disturbing. E. coli can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the focus of my current postdoctoral work, and I have some findings that suggest the answer might be yes. Now, before I go on, will all of you keep a secret? Yeah, sure. Okay, good. <laughs> Since this hasn't been published yet, you're being privileged to something special. And it, it, it's not official again, hasn't been peer reviewed, take it with a grain of salt, do not tell anyone. Uh, if we look at those SIP plus clones over time, so say from when they first evolved to 40,000 generations, we see that SIP plus is getting much better on citrate over time. By 40,000 generations, they're about 45% better at using citrate than the original SIP plus were. But at the same time, they're getting worse on glucose. In fact, by 40,000 generations, they're worse on glucose than the ancestor ones. Meaning that about 10,000 generations of adaptation growth in citrate has completely obliterated more than 30,000 generations of adaptation to glucose. So I'm currently working to see if the mutations that are making citrate better at citrate are also the ones causing this decline in fitness on glucose. And it'd be interesting if it turns out that this is the case, and I can tell you that this, I am finding instances where this is the case. So this would indicate that SIP plus is accumulating genetic incompatibilities with the ancestor, which is exactly what you should expect to see in speciation events, and it suggests that SIP plus is in fact becoming. It isn't, but it's becoming a new species. Again. <laughs> <laughs> not, not all of them. <laughs> I actually have a copy of, of this already up on my website with that portion redacted. <laughs> and uh, I'll have to talk to the jury. <laughs> yes, please do. Yeah. Uh, we're in the same lab, so, so I have an interest in it. Yeah, yeah, you do. <laughs> so to sum up, SIP plus gave an opportunity to examine an evolutionary innovation in the lab. 
and it was immediately caused by molecular tinkering that placed a pre-existing citrate transporter gene under the control of the new regulatory element. And this evolution was historically contingent, complex, and multi-step, involving three distinct phases of potentiation, actualization, and refinement that are like the typical of most evolutionary innovations. Moreover, the syphilis lineage may be becoming a new species, giving us a chance to, in the lab, investigate what Darwin called that mystery of mysteries. So I'd like to thank the members of the Linsky Lab, particularly Rich, for running what is uh, really the scientific equivalent of heaven on earth. Our resident goddess, lab manager, and surrogate mother, Mitch Fijela, for watching after us and keeping everything coming. A variety of others have helped over the years. Um, NSF Beacon and the Templeton Foundation for funding my work. Um, my wonderful undergraduate assistants, Maya Rolls and Keanu Weatherspoon, without whom I wouldn't have much to present today. Uh, and uh, I'd like to thank, given this is a biology teacher's uh, conference, Lynn Q, who was my high school chemistry and AP biology teacher, because without her I wouldn't be here. So, um, in, in uh, honor of her, I just want to say thank you to all of you. You do have an effect, and one of your students could be up for one day. So, with that, <laughs> I want to know the experiments I've after that. Um, I want to note that we have the EvoEd website, which has case studies for use in evolution education, including one on the Citrate project that I just talked about. Also, on my website, blountlab.org, I have copies of, of my research papers available for download, as well as presentations, including this one, which is already up there. And you're free to use them if you want. Also, I have copies of a very interesting article on which means and the long-term experiment, as well as some copies of my research papers up here, so if you want a copy, please let me know. And so, I don't know if there's time, but I'll take any questions if you have them. We have a couple minutes. Thank you. 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 Have you searched for these precursor mutations in the other 11 we don't know what those precursor mutations are, which is very frustrating. We have a ton of genomic data now, and I thought it was going to be a small part of my dissertation research. And it's now stretching on, that search is stretching on to be uh, the main focus of two other people's entire PhD dissertations. So we don't know them yet, but once we find them, yes, we're definitely going to be looking at the other one. And I was going to ask the same thing, so I already know the answer is no, but. Um, whether once you found those, whether you would actually try introducing those and seeing if you could accelerate the process. Oh, certainly. That would be something we would do, which, and that would actually be one of the ways of testing them, is to take those mutations, put them into, a, into the ancestral genome, and go through that same brute force experiment to see if we can actually get set plus means from the ancestor. Because that, one of the things I didn't mention is that among those 40 trillion cells were 10 trillion of the ancestor, not a one of which was a mutant. Whereas if we did find the actual potentiating mutations, we would expect to find at least one among another 10 trillion. I, I also wanted to say I thought it was a fantastic talk. Oh, thank you. <laughs> about the general interpretation of the Linsky long-term experiment in relation to um, a new experiment that um, I recently read a little bit about. And admittedly, I haven't read a lot about the new experiment, so I'm making some inaccurate assumptions. Please correct me. But, um, one of my understandings uh, from the Lenski experiment was that because evolution depends on these random stochastic events, it's very difficult to project the trajectory evolution of fitness or increased fitness. And then I think somebody at Yale just recently did a long-term evolution experiment with yeast, where they're, they're saying that the, the trajectory of fitness is predictable. Is that, are you aware of that? Or? Well, I would say that based on what we've seen, the, the trajectory of fitness is fairly uh, predictable, at least in its shape. Because what that, that diagram I showed, all the populations look like that, where there's this rapid increase of first and then leveling off. So the trajectory is predictable, but the actual 
phenotypes and genotypes that underlie that, that is not necessarily critical. I'm not actually familiar with the experiment you're studying, you're, you're, you're mentioning, so I'm not, I can't speak on it. Yet. But that, that would be my interpretation for the long term. Okay, well, great. Well, thanks again for the talk.